Greetings, folks, and we're back to look at more on RC circuits. So where we left off was looking at our capacitor being driven by a nice ideal current source. Now, what we said is that the characteristic equation dvdt the rate of change of voltage across the capacitor is equal to i over c so if we plot that we get something that looks like this here's time here's the voltage across the capacitor you get a nice straight line right. and the value of that is clearly dependent on the on the size of the current and the size of the capacitor bigger currents smaller capacitors faster change right steeper slope okay if I have a circuit driven by a voltage source we get something a little bit perhaps more interesting so let's take a simple RC circuit and what I'm going to do is put a little switch in here here's my resistor R and my capacitor C oops Okay, now at rest, with no stored charge or anything like that, right, there's, there's no current flowing through here, the capacitor voltage is zero, the resistor uh, voltage is zero, basically all of the source drops across the open switch, that's one way of looking at it. Initially the cap is a short, okay, so we throw the switch, make contact. What ends up happening? Well, the voltage across the capacitor cannot change instantaneously. It's still a short. Okay. So when I look around this loop, KVL still has to uh, pan out. So if that's a short, all of E must drop across to R. So the circulating current at that instant is E over R basic Ohm's law okay now that current is essentially the same as this case over here in other words that currents feeding a capacitor you could you know mentally you could just think of making the conversion on this what is this as a current source so um, what we find as a plot for this um, capacitor voltage Is that it does in fact start to take off okay and again how steep this is is a function of the size of the voltage the size of the resistor because that sets the value of the current all right so big voltage small r we get a big current this change is going to be very very quick okay all right so we can say then that you know if we look back at this equation dv dt is equal to I over C, but I is E over R. So that's E over R, that's my I value, that's divided by C. Okay, or if you prefer a nicer way of drawing this, as you'll see, is 1 over RC times E. Now I wait a little bit. See, if this was just a pure current source, if we waited um, RC worth of time, I'd have RC over RC on this thing, and then we'd be back at E, okay? Straight line. In other words, we have a sort of a trajectory like this, okay? But that's not what's gonna happen here, because once this current starts to flow, the capacitor voltage starts to build, right? And as the capacitor builds, KVL says voltage across the resistor has to drop. Okay, so KVL tells you that as VC goes up, then VR has to drop. Now, why is that important? Because as VR drops, the current also drops. 
Right? That's what sets the current, the drop across the R. That's basic Ohm's law. Well, what's the impact of that? Less current means slower rate of change. That's the same value of current, or excuse me, it's value, same value of capacitance, but it's a smaller current. So this thing starts to peel off. In other words, it starts to slow down. And this process just keeps on going because the more voltage we develop across the capacitor, the less there is for the resistor, the smaller the current will be, and therefore the smaller the rate of change. So essentially, this thing will eventually just sort of flatten out. And the question is, where does it flatten out to? Well, obviously, it's going to flatten out at E. Because as this voltage gets very, very close to E, there's a minuscule amount of voltage left to drop across the resistor. The current becomes minuscule likewise, and the rate of change of capacitor voltage pretty much goes to, to, to zero, right? It approaches zero. So I have this interesting kind of shape. Take a closer look here. So if I were to plot VC over here, right, this thing is going to initially take off at this rate, but then fall down so that it hits some value over here like E. We get something that kind of goes like this. Right. Maybe not the best drawing in the world, but you get the idea. Okay. You want a nicer version of that? Well, get out your book. So here we are on page 275. So this is a normalized charge discharge curve that we have. Um, and this is the thing that I'm attempting to draw nicely here, right? Here's your initial takeoff. Here's the actual curve. And as you'll see, there is a mirror image to this. This falling curve is, in fact, what the current and the resistor voltage happen to be doing. All right. Now, as I said, if we had waited RC worth of time, that initial rate of change would have hit 100%, would have hit E. In fact, it takes a lot longer than that to get up to E. Theoretically, it never gets to E, but, you know, it gets close enough that we can say it's virtually the same. If we call that amount of time, RC, a time constant, it will take five time constants for this thing to get to virtual value, the 100%. It's, you know, like 99 point whatever percent. So we can say that a time constant... Is simply equal to R times C. R and ohms, C and farads. Obviously, big capacitors, big resistors are going to give us long time constants. Time constants can be in the nanoseconds, they can be in the seconds. All depends on the values that we're using. Right? But when I get out to five of these things, uh, and we use tau to indicate time constant, when I get out to five tau, we can say, yeah, we're virtually there. We're virtually at 100%. Okay, That's where we wind up. So what is the shape of this thing? Right. What's, an, what's an equation for this thing? Well, this is actually a, uh, an exponentially associated curve. Um, the falling curve, which I'll tell you what, I'll put over here. So as I mentioned, this is the... Uh, this would be the... Uh, resistor voltage or the current that's going to start at some max value like in this case E over R and then drop down like this. So we're going to get the 5 tau down here. It's going to be virtually zero. All right. so the maximum value if I was going to look at the current on here in other words what's the current as a function of time it's going to be the maximum value which is E over R times little e, the base of uh, natural logs, raised to the minus t over tau. Minus t is the time of interest, you know, where along this curve do you want to find, you know, right here, where do you want to find the current, All right? So this is, your, this is how you do it. You just plug in the value of t, um, grind through this equation, and you get your, your value of i at that instant. Once you know that current, 
It's just Ohm's law to find the voltage across the R. So if this is the decay, then 1 minus the decay gives us this, gives us the, the rising, in other words, the, the voltage sitting across the capacitor. So we could say that Vc, again, as a function of time, is going to be its maximum value, E, times 1 minus the same quantity, right? E to the minus T over tau. All right, so you could just get out your calculator, grind this thing through, or you could use the table right, that I had um, in the book and just you know, do it graphically if you were so inclined. But this is what you're going to see. Okay, so very quickly, put some numbers on here. Let's say, so this is just like our original. So let's say we have uh, you know, 1K ohm over here, and I have a 1 microfarad capacitor. Maybe that's 10 volt source. So one question would be, you know, how long does it take to get to steady state? What is steady state? Steady state is always 5 tau. Okay, 5 tau always. That's, that's the definition for steady state for these kinds of circuits. Always 5 tau. So what's tau? It's R times C. All right, so that's 1K ohm times 1 microfarad. Okay, the Ks and mics will get you millis. So this is equal to 1 millisecond. 5 tau is 5 milliseconds. That's how long it takes for this capacitor voltage to get up. Now, obviously, if you were sitting in lab, you're not going to do this with a stopwatch, right? Not with 5 milliseconds. You can watch this very nicely on an oscilloscope if you repeated it. If you had a switch that was opening and closing, like, for example, if you drove this with a square pulse, you could see that. Or you could in, put in much larger values. You could put in much larger capacitor and resistor values. You know, if we were talking um, maybe 100 K ohms, okay, and we crank that capacitor up, you know, 10 microfarads, 50 microfarads, something like that, now you can be talking time constants of several seconds. And in the lab manual, there is a, uh, a lab to do exactly that. We put in large values, and you can sit there with a watch, with a stopwatch, and, you know, every few seconds determine, okay, what's the voltage, what's the voltage, what's the voltage, right? You know, maybe every 5, 10 seconds, you know, whatever it works out to. And you just measure the voltage. Get your digital meter out there, right? And when you plot it, connect the dots, you should get this nice um, exponential sort of rise and fall that we have here. Okay, all right, so in this case, it's five milliseconds. Now, what happens now that it's charged up, right? Let's say you wait a couple of seconds. I go in with my meter and I measure it and I should get all 10 volts here, right? You know, initially it was zero, boom, in five milliseconds, it gets up to 10 volts. Okay, so what happens if then you open this switch, right? Just leave it open the way it's actually drawn. Well, if it's an ideal capacitor, it'll just hold the 10 volts on here. Real-world capacitors will leak. The charge will leak off. This, this is one of the characteristics of the dielectric. You know, a better dielectric has less leakage. It'll hold that charge longer. But what happens if you then were to do something like this, like you were to short that down? Well, now this capacitor discharges. Actually, now it, it's like a source because you charged it up initially with this polarity, you know, think of it as a drop, right? And now that you've um, took away the power supply and shorted this, this thing now delivers current in the opposite direction through the resistor. So if you were to plot the resistor voltage, right, it was going to do this. It's going to start up here at, at 10 volts. And after 5 milliseconds, it's going to go to zero. And then as soon as you flick the switch down so it shorts this way, that voltage reverses, in other words, you're going to get a spike that goes down like this, because KVL still has to be satisfied. So you get 10 volts across the cap, that 10 volts would appear across here, so you'd get a negative 10 volts, and then it would discharge again back towards zero. In this case, it's identical as far as the resistance, so it's still going to be 5 milliseconds, it's going to get back to zero. Maybe you stuck another resistor in here. Well, guess what? It's going to take longer now 
okay? That's going to reduce the current, so the rate of change will be slower. And you'll get something that goes, you know, like that. Well, what if you have a more complicated circuit? In other words, what if we have, you know, uh, something like this? And you want to find out, you know, again, what's steady state? How long is that? Um, you know, what are the curves look like for a circuit like this? What's VC doing? I know in general it's going to follow this red thing, right? It's going to do this. Um, but to what value? Well, the obvious thing to do here would be to Thevenize this. Hey, we're back to Thevenin's theorem. So if I Thevenize it, I'm going to wind up with, once again, a voltage source and a resistor. That I can... Um, solve using the technique we just looked at. And that would tell me exactly what that capacitor voltage is going to do. It's going to tell me how high it's going to get, right? The Thevenin open circuit voltage is going to be the ultimate voltage for this. And we're also going to be able to determine how long it takes, because the Thevenin resistance now of this circuit will be the charging resistance that we wind up with in that equation. Okay, so you know, we see this sort of combination of theorems working together. That might not have been immediately apparent where we're going to use Thevenin's theorem when we first brought it up, but, you know, here's one possible place where you could use it with a more complicated circuit. Okay? Very good.